So, um, so uh, welcome and hi, Joan, to the NYU Skirball Paradigm Shifter series. I'm so happy to see you again. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm really pleased to introduce um, Joan Scott. Uh, you are a Professor Emerita at the School of Social Science at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. And you're the author of many books. I'm going to mention only a few Gender and the Politics of History, The Politics of the Veil, Sex and Secularism, and then most recently on the Judgment of History, how history may not judge us in the way we want to, always in the right way, because sometimes people wait for that. So maybe we can touch on that book, which just came out in 2020. Um, but to start us out, I wanted to just get you to um, uh, address this, this framing of this series, which is that we're living through so many paradigm shifts. People say that with such ease. There's things to consider, climate change, race relations in this country, gender relations, all these things that have to be really rethought. And you were part of, uh, not the only person, of course, you were part of a movement um, that crystallized in an essay that you wrote. And I just wanted to start us out on this essay, which then you readdressed and will refer to these kind of uh, reassessments, um, which uh, is, is gender as a useful category of historical analysis in 1986. And I, I'm one of the many people who've assigned this essay many times <laughs> to my students, although I don't teach history, I'm not a historian. It's just a very useful essay, I think, for students and for me to understand. Um, and can you just say a little bit about the background and where you, what were you thinking about when you wrote this essay, which now I should say to our listeners and viewers is one of the most frequently cited essay in all of uh, modern historical scholarship, one of the most widely accessed ones and downloaded ones. So it's proven to be a kind of reference point for a lot of people who want to think about how to do history, I think. Right. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the origins of it were, um, were a few things. <laughs> One was um, <clears throat> I had been going from the beginning to the um, women's history conferences, the Berkshire conferences on women's history that were started in the 1970s. And <clears throat> excuse me, they were, um, the point of them was to resurrect, the, the Berkshire Conference on, of Women Historians was founded in the 1920s or 30s to bring the few women who were in the American Historical Association together to talk about how to improve their presence and, and how to get uh, serious attention, not, not to women's history, but just to women as historians um, in, in those years. And then in the 70s, when the women's movement sort of took form, they were uh, the, the, the small conference, which had continued over the years to be just women professionals meeting together into conferences on the history of women. And there was one particularly exciting one, I think it was at Radcliffe, um, at which Natalie Davis was one of the speakers. And she, not, not for the first time, but she, she sort of made sense to me of thinking of, in terms of gender rather than of women's history. Uh, gender was already out there for feminists to talk about using the work of um, the psychology, the psychologists, um, I'm gonna forget their names, but, um, Money and, um, um, Stoller and Money, who had looked at um, intersex children and tried to think about uh, how to correct for um, um, hermaphroditic uh, bodies. Right. And the term gender was picked up from them, but Natalie used it for historians. And she talked about the fact that there wasn't women's history without a relationship to men's history. And mm -hmm. that gender was the way to think about that the nature of that relationship. So that was the one sort of, of spark in the um, thinking about women and women's history. 
And that was in the 70s. In 1980, I went to Brown University as the Nancy Duke Lewis Professor of um, Women's Women and, and history. I think it was. I don't women's know. women's studies, probably. Women's at that point. Studies and, yes, and and, sure. and history. And um, there were at Brown a group of um, post-structuralist psychoanalytic feminists, um, and we met together in a reading group. And that really kind of of blew my mind. I mean, I read things I had never read before. I was, I remember reading Foucault's um, The Order of Things, and and. It was it was my sort of um, epistemological uh, yeah. trauma, <laughs> you know, the road to Damascus. That was my my yeah. revolution, yeah. and um, and and so then when I when when the American Historical Association um, meeting in 1985 asked for um, two feminist historians to talk about their work. Gerda Lerner on the one hand and me on the other, we were on this panel together. Um, that seemed to me the moment to um, sort out the confusion, the insights, the possibilities that had been introduced to me, both in Natalie's thinking about gender and relational history, and then these much more um, uh, powerful <laughs> it, it, uh, impacts of uh, post-structuralist and psychoanalytic theory. And most of those women, I was the only historian, all of the rest of them were in literature. And so I was being kind of inducted into linguistic, the linguistic turn, <laughs> kicking and screaming, I could say. Uh, but in any case, that was, that was the sort of origin of the piece. And that's why when um, people sort of talk about, and when you even suggested, you know, that I was a kind of, I was a paradigm shifter, I thought, no, no. Um, what I did in that essay was um, synthesize and and kind of, of uh, bring together what then um, what was happening as a paradigm shift, and that I articulated. And can we stay for a moment with these meetings, so the Berkshire Conference, and when Natalie Demon Davis gave a talk? What is the mood? I'm really interested because one thing we're trying to figure out, and we'll get to your sort of so to be saying, you're summarizing what's in the air among certain people, and then also other people have no interest in this at all. Oh, but no, and I was mood? attacked for, for, so what's for betraying the, the field, too. And when you say, like, it was really for women in the field of history to get together, what is the mood in these moments? Is it excited? Is it defensive? What is oh, the no. atmosphere? It was unbelievably exciting. I mean, people, thousands of people came. Um, the Berkshire Conference goes on now still, but it's now become um, a more routine scholarly conference. In those years, it was the sense of discovery that was just mind blowing. Um, I think the, the Radcliffe one, graduate students would come with sleeping bags, you know, finding places they could, friends or colleagues or people they didn't even know who would invite them to sleep over. I mean, th these were events of enormous moment um, and they were less, um, conflictual than they were kind of, of uh, they were debates, uh, mm -hmm. they were arguments, but it was um, like big things to think about. All of the big uh, scholars of, of the time spoke of them, Carol Smith Rosenberg, Natalie, Natalie Zeman Davis, uh, Gerda Lerner, I'm, I'm going to leave out dozens, so I won't. I don't. I don't want to offend anybody. But it, you went kind of of looking for uh, the things that would help you understand and make this field uh, come to life. It, I, I've, it was the most exciting intellectual kind of experience I think that I've ever had. And then the second moment you talked about when you go to Brown and you're suddenly, not suddenly, you're in a meeting now with people who are not historians, who are reading literature and psychoanalysis and maybe continental philosophy, let's right. say. So I also want to just sort of emphasize this point of you are outside of your discipline getting an impulse for what your discipline could do. And that was scary. <laughs> the first was um, unbelievably exhilarating because we were all kind of trying to figure this out together. We were right. opening a field. The second, the Brown experience in the first year or so was terrifying because mm. it was requiring me to rethink 
paradigms, if you will, yeah. that I was, you know, I was wedded to uh, because most of that women's history work um, maintained itself within certain problematics of the historical discipline, uh, a certain kind of narrative, uh, the notion that we were, that archives produced um, uh, unquestionable <laughs> documentation right. of things, uh, that the relationship between the past and present was unquestioned, that what we were doing was writing about the past, not interrogating it, but documenting it. And so the, the, the demand of post-structuralist theory was to critically engage that paradigm. And for the first year or so, I, I just, I felt really, um, frightened is probably the wrong word because I was also enormously attracted to it. Obviously, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have done it but if it were. Were you aware that the concept you were working with, that there's a story to tell, that there are subjects in history, that some people have power whose titles we know, who has records are in the archives, and there are other people who are subjected to history. Were you aware, sort of, was there a steering in you before that? This is not quite matching up with yeah. what you want to know? Yes, because I always had a political approach to the mm. history that I wrote. I mean, that's why I did women. That's why I did labor history. That's why I yeah. did women's history. I mean, the appeal of social history for me in the 1960s when I was in graduate school was exactly to sort of make visible uh, stories that had been invisible, to um, argue that there were subjects of history who had been neglected as subjects of history. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and the move from labor history to women's history was exactly that, was making visible uh, those groups who were um, l considered less important or less relevant right. to the national political story that history traditionally um, had told. So yes, I was certainly already critically primed mm. for what I encountered um, at, at, um, at Brown. And, but now you're going through this experience and you're saying it was scary. So it wasn't that you walked in and two months later you realized, oh, there's my new vocabulary. Now I can move on. <laughs> no, no, it took, it took a couple of years. I mean, I, I was one of the, I was the founding director of the Pembroke Center for Teaching and Research okay. on Women. Yeah. And in the seminar we had, and that seminar still goes on. And it's one of the few feminist seminars that is a theory seminar still to this day. Um, but in those first couple of years of the, the Pembroke seminar, I would listen to these papers and, and the speakers that we, Gayatri Spivak came, <laughs> Jane Marcus, I mean, these, these wow. people who came and gave, gave their talks and I would just kind of work really hard to sort of factor in what I was hearing and figure out how to do what then could be done. And that's how I think of that gender paper is that it was a kind of the, the marriage of um, a certain kind of critical history that I already knew with the emphasis on language and, and um, critically reading in ways I had not been trained to read. So for my students that take away what, when I introduce them to this paper, I say, okay, this is gender as a category, which they take for granted today because they are familiar with departments of gender studies. They use the word gender to refer to what used to be referred to as biological sex only. So that term has become known, but I always try to make them see how you use gender to say gender allows us to see how the relationship between and among the sexes is organized and how power structures this relationship. Right, and how it's always different in different circumstances. I mean, that's where the historian in me stays put. That is, this is not, gender is not a kind of universal category, yeah. the terms of which we always understand. But that's why I, you know, I say, or, or I, we didn't say this to begin with, but that um, essay that's the, the American Historical Review one of 1986, that essay was called gender colon, a useful category of historical analysis, question mark. And so the original title is a question, okay. The original title had a question mark and the editors of the AHR told me that they did not allow question marks in the title <laughs> of article. <laughs> the orthodoxy of the profession, right? Oh, they just wanted sort of like a fact to take away, not sort of an opening up of exactly, it. Exactly, exactly. Okay. And I think in fact that my position is stronger now than it would have been then 
that what gender is, is a question. That is how is this relationship being constructed? Mm -hmm. What kinds of power is it serving? Mm -hmm. In what ways is it um, enabling the naturalization in some cases of other aspects of society that seem to have nothing to do with uh, sex or, or yeah. gender? So the question mark is the really crucial historical, you know, it, yeah. it, it, it keeps me as a historian. <laughs> And did gender then, if, if it's a question mark, did it allow you to see new things or is it seeing the same things in new ways? No, I think it's to see new things. I, I think that it, and it's around the question of difference, I think that, that it ultimately expands beyond um, the difference between the sexes to differences in societies more generally. Okay. Um, it, it prepared me or taught me to read for how difference is constructed and what the power relationships of difference are and whether, whether and how racial difference um, feeds off or resonates with a kind of natural difference that gender is understood also to um, underline, mm -hmm. um, to think in terms of um, oh, other kinds of, of, of social differences, some of which depend on the difference between the sexes, and some of which are just given um, more power by the resonance with those. And the reference here is to the so-called natural difference between yeah. men and women. And I read some of the responses to your paper where people said American foreign policy was constructed as such. The relation in the American South, antebellum South, to slaveholding is a kind of marital relation to the woman who has to be protected and is in a domestic sphere. Mm -hmm. So that the, the supposedly natural relation between men and women becomes the model unconsciously or consciously to structure all sorts of other relations. Right. Exactly. And exactly. let me go. Let me go back to a basic question. This is sort of my <laughs> sort of, but this persistence of the biological model, the persistence of this natural distinction. How do you make sense of that in this analysis when gender becomes the framework? Well, what you ask is how the biological reference works. Yeah. And what what I say, and and I'm not the old Judith Butler says this. Other people say this that, it in fact it's gender that. Um, it, gender doesn't um, explain the biological difference of sex. The biological difference of sex is offered as the legitimation for the differences of gender. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. that makes a, a, a big difference mm -hmm. in um, the way you then think about what's going on. But you know, the question I would ask now is if you think about the author authoritarian regimes of, of the 21st, 20th and 21st century, right. the one we hopefully have just avoided in, in the United States. Right. But if you think about mm -hmm. Trump, Bolsonaro, uh, Orban, um, Putin. Putin, the Turkey, the, the uh, Erdogan, Erdogan yeah. uh, the Polish uh, uh, leader, yeah. all of those guys are intent on reasserting the natural roles for women and men in society. In, in, in um, Hungary, Orban actually outlawed gender studies in right. the universities. So why um, is that? Why is there this anxiety around a field, you think the field of gender studies, which is not exactly the dominant field in any university and, and then exactly. Orban outlaws gender studies of all things. It's yeah. actually, and we've talked about this before, in this country we have so-called liberal professors. We have a colleague here at NYU who rails against gender studies and he says because gender should be everyone's business so we shouldn't have a department devoted to it. <laughs> yeah right and he's the first one who's going to teach the courses right in his right. department. <laughs> right. So what is this anxiety or what is why do why is this? Well I think because the natural the natural biological model is so powerful you okay. know. Yeah. Um, but but the question for me is why when they have so many other things they can outlaw, do these guys uh, depend so importantly mm -hmm. on um, insisting on the naturalness of the relations between uh, men and women? Mm -hmm. And I don't think we know the answer to that completely. And some of it has to do with masculinity, with the, some of it has to do with their um, 
their claims to uh, represent, to embody the security state. We will protect you, our citizens, as fathers protect their children, uh, as you know, kings <laughs> protect their, um, their, their uh, constituents. Uh, and we can't leave it to um, constructed notions or, or, or because if, you know, if, if, you, if you get rid of the biological uh, superiority of men in, in certain areas, the, the right. traditional uh, role for uh, fathers, uh, husbands, politicians, powerful men, um, then you undermine something of their credibility. I mean, but but they're so aware of it. And that's the thing that, that yeah. it's how powerful that awareness is. Sometimes it's connected to the Catholic church as in Poland, but but not really. I mean, right. <laughs> you know, they don't need, they, they're, a, a, they're um, and the Catholic church has been one of the groups that has led the campaign, the anti-gender gender campaign all over the world. Right. But that I don't think that's a kind of, of resource that these authoritarians turn to, mm -hmm. it's not the explanation for why it matters so much to them that gender not be taught. And it has also to do with homosexuality. If you teach gender, then you're um, licensing homosexuality. Uh -huh. And again, homosexuality is the undermining of the masculinity of the powerful father of the nation state. And in, in your analysis of this so-called natural relation, this natural difference that you refer to, and I'm sure I was, I'm curious how the historians responded to psychoanalysis, which essentially says, let's say, to, I mean, it's hard to summarize a hundred years of psychoanalysis, but from Freud to his feminist critics, that there's something deeply unsettling about the human relation to difference, that we actually tend to turn it into a hierarchy, that we tend to mm -hmm. stabilize, but he said there's nothing given in this relation. Right. For him, for Freud, this sexual difference was an enigma or a question or difference right. as such, and he couldn't quite settle it. Right. But we tend to put it into, and Freud himself put it, of course, into some kind of patriarchal structure in some ways, through some of the explanations, but you use psychoanalysis to keep this space open. Yeah. Right? To not have to refer back to biology saying, here's the factual truth of our bodies and that's it, that's the baseline. That's yeah. not your baseline for this analysis. No, the, the baseline for the analysis is what is it about this um, insistence on the natural difference yeah. that um, is, or, or to put it in the other terms, what is it about gender's questioning of nature yeah. that yeah. is so psychically unsettling to these guys hmm. um and it and it is it, it's really un incredibly powerful i mean yeah, and right. and you know i think there are people working on this on this question historians among them yeah. um but um uh, i think it's one of the questions that we now face that gender is a useful category for interrogating mm. and psychoanalysis i think you're right uh, my sense is that that there's something about um modern commitments to masculinity that are at the heart of this. That there's something about, um, you know, Trump, I, I had, I did a piece on, on Trump <laughs> early on. Um, and, and what I thought was there that um, he was appealing not so much to normal masculinity, but to what Freud and Totem and Taboo calls the sort of Ur father, you know, the primal father. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and that always in the story of masculinity, there is, or in the, the, the myth that is constructed around the, the, the uh, power of kings and their, the arrival of democracy, what's, what's constructed around that is the notion that there was a primal father. He could have all the women. He made the law, but he didn't have to follow the law. Right. Um, you know, here we know who that was, right? Right, right. right. Um, and and that, having been unseated by the band of brothers in the, in in the democratic revolutions, right? Um, there is always a remnant of the desire of any of those brothers to be him, yeah. and the claim is the phallus is is what they have. The phallus mistaken in Lacanian analysis for the mm -hmm. penis. Oh, I've got that, you know, 
I have the power. And you can see in, in the history of contests against democracy, the appeal to some kind of primal masculinity as, as uh, an answer to the uh, instability of society, to economic crisis, to the dangers of war, whatever it is. Right. The, 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 the primal father is always waiting there to be invoked by one of the sons who is what's, what again, Lacan calls the phallic exception. The guy who, who's not like all the brothers, castrated in some way by the father, but that person. And I wonder if you think this is true also for, let's say, people who didn't agree or cheer for Trump. That there's a kind of fascination. And I do think we just oh, yeah. go through, a, we went through a four year full on addiction to Trump and suddenly he's gone silent. And there's a kind of sense of psychic loss. And we're wondering, what is he doing now? There's a, there was a huge investment on both sides. And it's either the good father or the bad father, the strict yeah. authoritarian punishing father. So in some ways, but I want to go back to something. You wrote this essay third in 1986. So that is 35 years ago. But we're still with the same questions. Yeah. So in some ways, when you to go back to that moment, you presented um, and you said you summarized basically the work of a lot of people around you and really mostly women historians, yeah. right? Yeah. And you gave kind of a voice to what they were saying. And, to, and I want to go back to this moment 35 years ago because you think, wait, wouldn't people have understood and learned something and we wouldn't be obsessing about the same questions <laughs> about, about the projection yeah. of the father yeah. today? It's just how much um, academics can influence anything that happens in the real world. Right? Well, how did it influence people in academia to start with? Like, how did how do you think it played out? I think for some, it, it, it's been a really important um, essay to contend with. Um, for others, uh, I have to say, there's been, a, a, for me, sometimes an entire misreading of things. I mean, sometimes people will send me an article and say, and footnote the gender article, and yeah. they say, you know, this has had such an impact on me. And I read the article and I think, if this were a graduate student, that she would get a D. You know? oh, really? In fact, in one case, I was so angry at the presumption of this person that oh. I went back and I said, the only comment I have on, on your article is that I ask you to remove the citation of me as, as an influence on this article, because there's no way that you have understood what I was trying to say. So what do you think they mostly misunderstood or what's the way in which it could they have- take gender to be um, what you said a few minutes ago, an, an applicable, uh, to, to refer to the, to in a kind of universal yeah. uh, uh, fixed way to the difference between women and men. It's, mm -hmm. it's, and they do or do not sort of realize that the question being raised is one about the biological grounding for gender and they'll in fact, grounded in biology mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. or the, the things that I think I raise in there too about the fact that women are not always the same category. Um, that's the Denise Riley, the huge contribution of Denise Riley, whose book is published in the same year as mine and to whom I'm still talking about these issues all the time. But she, Denise Riley says very clearly that, you know, in the title of her book, Am I That Name? What does it mean to be a woman? And, right. and can we assume that w the women of ancient Rome and Greece are the, the same in some way or another as we are? Um, and how do, we, how do historians respond to this question? Were, were people even the same? I mean, Baudelaire, yeah. has this very, Baudelaire has a very strange comment somewhere he writes in 1860s Paris. He said, we cannot imagine what a smile would have meant or looked like even a hundred years ago. Oh, that's wonderful. Because I he doesn't that. believe that people say the same through history or culture. Yeah. He says, we can't even interpret another person, but that also forecloses a lot of historical analysis because we have to assume something. Well, yeah, but I think again, the, the, the difference is what you assume and what you question. Okay. And, and for me, what I learned, I think, most from post rationalist theory mm -hmm. is that you always question the categories that you assume to be the most evident. The, the most so natural. The most, the most, well, or, or the most evident. That is, we're dealing with women through time. Okay. But the women part of it doesn't change, or yeah. the men part of it doesn't yeah. change. Yeah. Um, and that's even as historians will say that they won't, that psychoanalysis is a, a historical approach to um, right. 
to human existence, even as they're saying that, they're using the no accepted categories as if they were ahistorical. And, and what your contribution was is also goes to a, the idea of women's history. You said women's history inadvertently kind of reinscribed in women. some cases, women sort of people started focusing on the women in this time period. And you said that just reinforced a kind of category that we don't even understand in the present and we're now projecting it back. And right. saying, this is how women lived in, I don't know, 19th century. You wrote a book on glassmakers in, in, <laughs> in France. So it's, if you had said, oh, these are the women in that, in that town right there, you would have projected back this stable category, which isn't stable. Right, right. And of course, in that book, I hardly talked about women at all. I just talked about the wives of glass workers. <laughs> but that's 1974. That was before my, my uh, switch to women and then to gender. <laughs> but, but actually, I'm quite, I brought it up as you, this is your first book, because it's labor history. And it's kind right. of, and I'm, I'm really interested when something shifts for somebody. And let's say the essay came out, you said it's, it was misunderstood, but it also produced people it gave him a set of questions on how to think about gender. And let me ask this very pointed question. How did male historians and people who did regular history respond to this? Did they think, oh, I have to now rethink my way of doing it? Or what was your, no, I, you talked about your first presentation. I think it was at Princeton, right? At the Institute. No, not, yeah. at, not at the Institute. Yeah, you, we can't confuse Princeton and the Institute. They're no, 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 right. In the in, at, at Institute for Advanced Study. So it was my prime, you know, my beginning first lecture I ever gave as a new uh, faculty member at the Institute for Advanced Study, the first woman ever to be appointed in the history, or the second woman, I'm sorry. The, the first was Hetty Goldman, who was an archaeologist, who was appointed in 1936. And 50 years later, in 1985, I was appointed to, to the faculty at the Institute. In 19, I actually think, I really want to underline this, uh, particularly because you know, I use these videos in teaching that for yeah. my students to imagine that you were the second yeah, woman yeah. ever yeah. to, and, this, and just give us one sentence about the Institute for Advanced Study. What is it? The Institute for Advanced Study was founded in, the, in 1930 um, by uh, those who were, well, by, uh, scholars who wanted to create an institution that was like the German um, uh, high institutes for advanced study with a faculty who would be doing pure research. Okay. Its initial uh, appointment was Einstein um, and, and it was the place, I mean, this, every, if, if nobody knows nothing else about the Institute, they know that that's where Einstein was when he came okay. to the United States. Okay. And over the okay. years it acquired different schools where we call them instead of departments mm -hmm. it was math physics natural science it was called historical studies and finally the school of social science which is what i was in mm -hmm. and that was founded in depending on your <laughs> on how you want to date it 1970 71. okay and the school that i was came to was clifford gertz albert hirschman and michael walzer and i was the fourth professor in that school and as I say, the second woman um, in the Institute's history. And the first was in 1936. It was Hetty Goldman, who came from um, Germany, was part of the exodus from Germany, um, and who it turned, who was the daughter of the founders of Goldman Sachs, and who it turned out was getting a set, the, one of the principles of the Institute is that all faculty will receive the same salary, except for Hetty Goldman whose father was paying her salary at Turner. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> unbeknownst to her. And so, I mean, she, there's a whole other story. That's strange. It's a fabulous story. But so I came in, in 1985 and the first lecture I gave was my um, gender paper. But this was your idea of an entrance to give you- It was you, sort of inaug paper. my inaugural address, right? You I mean, gave you- we don't have things like that at the Institute, but it was the first time yeah. anybody. So all these historians came over from Princeton, Bob Darnton, um, Lawrence Stone, a couple of others. I don't remember who else. Mm -hmm. And I, as I describe it in that piece I, I sent you, yeah. I, 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 as I talked, they sat there with their arms folded and they kept leaning farther and farther and farther back in their chair. Uh -huh. And if, if I needed anything to know, and they asked no questions at the end. Okay. The, the, a couple of people asked questions, among them Carol Pateman, who that year was a, a visiting person in the political science department at Princeton. Mm -hmm. And, um, but then they apparently went back to the department um, 
and and a friend of mine who was there reported on how horrified they were. Lauren Stone said that I wasn't a historian, I was doing philosophy. Bob Darnton's question, never to me, was, you know, so what if there were women in the French Revolution? What does that change about my understanding of the French Revolution? Um, mm. And there were others. <laughs> I mean, I, I never, they never, I mean, one of the things that always annoyed me was that they never confronted me. But actually, I want to stay with that for a moment. So yeah. you heard this secondhand <laughs> that they had objections. It's actually a funny put down to say you're doing philosophy. Some people would be proud to be called. Well, actually, that was what I aspired to. In some <laughs> like, exactly. Like, oh, my God. <laughs> you know? But there's the guild of historians who, who are saying, and so how did this feel? And I'm kind of interested because people working today to really challenge dominant ways of thinking. How did that feel to you? You arriving there, you have your new colleagues, you're supposed to live with them now for a long time. Well, they weren't my colleagues. They? They were, they were the your professional. My colleagues were more sympathetic. I mean, yeah. Gertz, I think, got it. Um, oh, yeah. And, and her, Albert Hirschman was always generous and, and you know, engaged. Um, yeah. And so uh, I didn't feel rejected by my colleagues. I didn't feel, I think I felt, um, both angry and um, uh, confirmed in my notion that the so-called radical path I was taking was the right one to take. You know, but that, you come from a family. We've talked about this before. Yeah. Your father was actually sort of fired from a job. He was fired from his teaching from the New York City uh, school system in in 1953. Yeah. For, so I come. You know, I'm I'm a sort of of. Um, radical brat in some ways. <laughs> you, but let's stay for the moment with this, this, so you felt angry and they're not getting it. So what was your next move? Because I'm interested, like, and I know, I know we don't want to say you were the one who invented this at all. You're summarizing, you're giving voice to a huge movement. But also I want to say this is a movement which is still not mainstream or accepted or tenured in universities. And for, for my students, the fact that I have to remind them, there were virtually no female faculty Right. In, still in my lifetime, really, they can't even see that. Well, one of the things, too, just to add to the, you know, that I came sort of prepared to fight was my years at the Pembroke Center at mm. Brown had mm. really um, given me an enormous amount of confidence. I knew by the, by the time I got to the Institute that I knew what I was talking about and that even if there weren't among many historians, yeah. there were in the fields of feminist work and feminist studies, people who might trusted and who liked what I was doing. And mm -hmm. so I didn't need the confirmation. And also, you know, here I was appointed to this position. They could like it or not. Right. It was a lifetime tenured position with a certain um, prestige attached right. to it. Right. And, and what I keep saying is that, you know, in the sciences and in math, when you're appointed to the Institute, it's a confirmation of your genius status. Mm -hmm. When you're appointed in history or in social science, and certainly for me in social science, it's the possibility for inhabiting a position you otherwise might not have. Hmm. So it became possible for me to um, write letters of recommendation for feminists whose tenure was being contested, okay. which would carry much greater weight than yeah. if I stayed at Brown. Um, it, I, I, I acquired just, you know, not having done anything. I mean, I've written, I'd written books and I was appointed for a reason, right. but um, those reasons had I remained in an, even a, a, a you know, first line um, university would never have been as powerful as what is ascribed to right. uh, your status at the Institute. And, just, and then you use this status to actually advance sort the of, did this become a sense, did you feel it, you were, in a sense, this is a bit of your mission now yeah. to say to advance this project. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, 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 and it became it became possible because this, the 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 standing of the institute enabled hmm. that to happen. So the second year, I was let's see, I came in 85, 85, 86, 87, 88. <clears throat> we all rotated theme seminars um, among the mm -hmm. faculty in the in the group. The first year I came. I can't remember, I mean, Albert, maybe it was Albert Hirschman who had <clears throat> a seminar on different new forms of, of economics, critical, radical economics. The next year I think was Clifford Gertz did something, the title of which I don't remember, but then my year, I had, my year came and I did gender. And I had 
uh, <laughs> it was quite a year. Um, you know, all the sort of people I thought needed to talk to each other. Some talked better and worse than others to each other. But Evelyn Fox Keller, Donna Haraway, Carol Smith Rosenberg, um, Judith Butler. That was where Judith Butler wrote Gender Trouble. She <laughs> came in as this assistant professor out of nowhere um, with a letter, a couple of letters of recommendation from people whose work I had read hmm. when I was at Brown. And I thought, okay, we try this person, you know, who knows what she can do. She had the book, yeah. her Hegel book, Subjects of Desire, yeah. Hegel and Trained Century France. But, you know, that was not, it was not really about gender. It wasn't, yeah. it wasn't. But no, she wrote that book here. Um, and we became lasting friends as, as a result. But, but so that was the seminar. I mean, it was, it, Lila Abuladad was in that seminar. Um, I can't now, again, I can't remember all of the, the players, but it was, extraordinary. And that sort of that a, a seminar on gender could happen at the Institute for Advanced Study, I think also attached a certain importance and that those people, yeah. famous as they were already, right. were members in the School of Social Science at the Institute, had been invited to the Institute to do their work, let them go home with one um, degree higher of recognition than they came with. What you're trying to do at this point is to say that gender, as the title of that essay is, a useful category, it's a useful category of historical analysis, meaning it's not, oh, here's the seminar on gender. And before that, it was probably on power and subjectivity. And before that, it's all on neutral objective subjects, which really means it's all men. And suddenly women are in the picture. So I think what is really important that gender still today carries us a little bit. Uh, that people say, oh, we're gonna talk about gender. And people say, oh, women. Right. And we're gonna add something now to the conversation which complicates it. But as if until now, until then everything worked fine. It was objective, it was research, it was validated by the institution. And now you're causing this issue because now you have to focus on gender. And then can they go back to their normal daily work after right. that? Right, right. Well, you know, hopefully that was the case. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, I think in some ways gender still, still has a, a, a powerful radical, you know, there, there have been three um, incarnations of my book, Gender and the Politics of History, the lead essay of which is the gender a useful category. Yeah. Um, and the first one, I, I don't know, I think the preface is just about, you know, how this book came to be. The second one, was 10 years later. And I was really depressed about how gender had been um, appropriated mm -hmm. by the World Bank, by, you know, to talk about women and the status of women and the relations between women and men. And it felt like it had lost its radical uh, punch. Mm -hmm. That is as a set of questions about the natural um, basis for the, the social differences that are established between women and men. And, and so then I was, I was really kind of, of at a loss to think, and I kept thinking, well, maybe we need a new, a new word. We need something new. And then in the 30th anniversary edition, which came out in, in 2018, uh, no, 2015, whatever 30 years was, it wasn't right. exactly. That's because 86 was the essay. So it must have been 80, 2016. 2016. Yeah. And, and, well, no, the, but the book was 88, so it was 2018. 18, was, the book yeah. was 88, so that was, that was it. it. It was it was 88, and, and then it was 2018. And then I said, no, if you look at the way this term continues to work, especially internationally, places where there's no translation for it, right. and they have to use the gender, or places where radical uh, right-wing opposition to gender have come. My favorite example is, is that is, during the um, debates in France about a gay marriage, mm -hmm. there were these Catholic and Muslim fundamentalist groups who carried big signs in a demonstration that said, no a la théorie du genre, no to the theory of gender. What other country in the world has right. political demonstrations against right. the theory? I mean, it was just like, it was like, but, but it just seemed to me that that kind of trouble that gender was causing yeah. 
meant that it was still working to do some of the things I wanted it to. Right, right, right. And we, not just me, but we wanted it to do. And, and I think that's still the case. I think it's still the case too. I actually think it's, I mean, I've talked about this in another air uh, interview. So one of my late teachers was Harold Bloom, mm -hmm. the conservative, cons right. cl not Alan Bloom. So Harold Bloom, no, literary critic. No, 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 I know. So, and he, I was very fond of him and I was very fortunate. I took some seminars with him at NYU and he said, the most radical and greatest change in the world is feminism uh -huh. yeah. because he said, it's only about 50 years old and it unsettles 2,500 years of culture, civilization, et cetera. He said it was the most radical thing that is possible. And I said, what? And he said, that women matter. He said, that is so radical. He said, and, he, and, and Harold would be in this kind of very self-dramatizing way. He was very charming in a way that, and I can't even begin to make sense so you would be, he said, and what you're saying is that gender remains a provocation and right. something. It's not settled. So even 30 years later, and even gender studies, we know all the academic disputes about departments. People don't know how to define themselves in good ways. There's an open. Right. What to call it. What to call it. But this, what you're saying in, in 2018, it still has this potential to unsettle a lot of assumptions. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and that, it seems to me, is the work it continues to be able to do. And let's go to one question that I've had in other uh, conversations, sort of gender in this understanding and the word race in the similar understanding are not biological givens. Right. And I, I had a conversation about James Baldwin with Rich Blind from the New School, and he actually walked me through this to say, like, this is not it doesn't exist as a reality that we just perceive, but it's right. something that we have learned how to see it in certain ways. Exactly, yeah. So can you say, a little, so when you see what, where this moved, so what happened to the field of historiography in those 30 years? Because you have, first of all, you have probably many more women in the field, right, yes, than you had in the, in the early 70s. You said you were at the University of um, Wisconsin. No. I, I got my PhD at Wisconsin. I taught at okay. North Carolina for... And and then and I went it, to Brown. Before. And I heard you in another interview where you said in Wisconsin, you were just slotted into a seminar and one of your professors said, no women in the seminar, it's distracting and disturbs the camaraderie. Yeah, well, it was, at Wisconsin, the way it worked then was the German system. You were assigned to a professor for life. Oh, wow. And so you came <laughs> into the, um, I came into the, um, this was like 1962. I came, you were interviewed by the chairman of the department mm. who was then Merrill Jensen, who. No, not yeah. Who who believed it was a wonderful historian of Jefferson, but who believed that women sort of messed up the um, the the camaraderie of the of the male mm. seminar. I think it was Jensen. I'm not sure who the chair was at that point. And so when women came in, they were usually assigned to um, other places, maybe to intellectual history, where right. Merle Purdy was, in which the the other guys didn't really think of as serious history in those years. But I was, he, so he said to me, well, what are you here to study? And unlike what we now face with graduate students coming into our universities or where they know exactly what they want to study, with whom they want to study, what they're going to do, what they're writing their dissertation on probably. I had no idea of any of that. Yes. So he said, what do you want to study? I said, well, history. And he said, what language do you have? And I had French. So he put me in the modern French history seminar. That's how it happened. <laughs> okay, that's not so bad. So thank God you it had was not so bad, except the guy who ran it, it was just for a year, was on his way out. And he was a very sort of, uh, uh, he had written, a, a, I think his thesis and maybe the only book he published was on the various Napoleonic constitutions that were produced in different states okay. during, as a result of Napoleonic invasions. And they, but then Harvey Goldberg, who was the, his, the biographer of John Jerez came. And although he was a very difficult person to work with, um, he made it, you know, he made it possible for this to be exciting and interesting and, and all the rest. And if you fast forward to today, when you sort of see in um, sort of the landscape of academia and then, and then also, which is interesting, I think that our culture's um, fascination with academia, I mean, uh, you know, we've both written about sort of the, the the major public discussions about the role of universities, which I find obviously interesting that people you think wouldn't care that much what happens in a classroom where I teach poetry or you teach history, but somehow that becomes a flashpoint in the culture wars. Yep. So where do you think this is today? Do you think when students arrive and they want to study history, they get 
already intuitively what you tried to argue in 1986? No, <laughs> I, it depends. It depends on the students. I mean, you know, if you read, if you read articles in the American Historical Review, yeah, um, I would say for the most part they tend to be what I would think of as more conventional. Hmm. Sometimes quite interesting, sometimes really interesting new information, but the the kind of theoretically driven um, pieces, whether they're about gender or, or not, are fewer than one would hope there would be. I mean, I think the 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 orthodoxy of the discipline um, remains uh, very much in place. One in which things like the categories of analysis are not interrogated; they're just kind of assumed a certain kind of narrative, uh, uh, the, the notion of the relation between um, past and present are taken for granted in ways that um, some of the more radical uh, disruptions of that have, have called into question. I mean, I have, I'm, I'm the editor of, of or one of the editors of a journal that's called History of the Present. And um, we publish what I like to think of as historically informed yeah. Work, but not only history. And some of the really, some of the really good articles uh, come from anthropologists or literary types. Or we published, you know, there are good historical pieces, but some of the history that's submitted to us is fine descriptive history, but it's not um, critical in its but engagement would, with the subject. Would you say, kind of the theory, what's not as pronounced as the theoretical analysis? And if I can paraphrase it and correct me if this is my understanding. What you're saying is that people use terms or concepts and don't question that this concept may not be the same or may have changed or may have actually meant something quite different. Right. right. I, I encountered this, I'm you know, a literary scholar. I edited a book of first texts in the American canon, the first text written by Native American, African American, mm -hmm. Chinese American, Mexican American. So the, the fir first published known text. All of the categories I use are retrospectively applied. The people who are writing don't identify as Asian American or right. as Latino. This term does not exist until 50 years after this first text is written. So everything I'm projecting backwards. And what you're saying, how can a young historian today operate and do both? This kind of questioning of the categories, the theoretical analysis, and then also do the work that, let me just put this kind of bluntly, the more direct archi sort of archival, archival work, historians yeah. archival work. How I do you combine this? <laughs> I think you have to. <laughs> yeah. huh. I mean, I, I well, let, let's take, take an example of something that I'm trying to do right now. When I was a graduate student at Wisconsin in 1964, I wrote a paper on Charles Fourier, the supposed utopian socialist of France, yeah. who lives 1772 to 1837, and who wrote all of this kind of sensationalist, some of it, you know, associational, how to sort of rearrange society so that work is pleasure and small groups live together and, and so on, but also had uh, sort of ideas about sexual revolution that were astonishing <laughs> in their time. I mean, there's no repression in Fourier. You, you, really? Uh, yes, we all have instincts to um, eat and for sex, not yeah. for reproduction, for pleasure. Yeah and that those have to be satisfied. And if they are satisfied, we won't have war, we won't have um, um, conspiracies, we won't, we'll be all be able to live together because he has this mathematical notion of, you know, how many it would take, how many different, and, and you know, <laughs> the sort of Judith Butler notion of undoing gender. I mean, there's as many as 810 possible um, combinations and permutations of <laughs> desire that you could possibly imagine. And if they're carefully matched yeah. and mingled, you get a perfect, happy society. Oh, so we, are, we, would, we would exist without lack and frustration and exactly. sublimation. So all of Freud would be gone. We don't have any bad, everything is- Everything is good. And, Marcuse, and so, like Marcuse's utopian idea, right? So, okay, so I, re I wrote this paper in 1964. <laughs> and I wrote a, a perfectly uh, good, intellectual history of Charles Fourier. Mm. I sort of tried to deal with some of the sexual stuff. Actually, the book that does most of that wasn't even published until 1967. His own book, it, it had been suppressed by his followers because they thought it was too sexy and too outrageous. Right. In any case, so I, I wrote this paper, but I always thought, and especially as I started to do 
theoretical stuff and psychoanalysis. And I kept thinking, you know, I would just love to go back there and see mm. how I would think that differently, mm. given what I now know or think. Yeah, yeah. And so David Bell, who, who runs the Davis Seminar at Princeton this year, the subject is revolution, asked me if I would do a paper. Mm. And I thought, well, I had just finished on the judgment of history, which, which we probably won't get to, but that's okay. We, indirectly, we've talked about it. We'll wait for history to do that work for right. us. Right. <laughs> so um, so I, I had just finished that book and I didn't have any big projects in mind. And so I thought, okay, this is my chance to go back to Fourier and I call it, you know, Fourier's sexual revolution. And I would try to figure out hmm. what I couldn't understand. And that's what I'm in the process of doing now. I mean, I can't tell you yet what I'm yeah, doing. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting. But it's really, it's it's really interesting to me in a way to see how differently I'm approaching the topic than I could possibly have done in 1964. So I think in that sense, yeah, those of us who are kind of who who hold on to some kind of theoretical training or, yeah. or insight yeah. are in a position to think differently about things we once didn't know how to think about. But well, what you're saying, so maybe this is a good way to sort of, this is not going to be do justice at all to your book, The Judgment of History, but what you're saying, there's a continual revision of your own concepts. Right. So it's not that you settle on this concept, which would be this kind of eschatological, okay, I got it, I understand, this is the end point. There's justice or there's equality. And once we reach it or equity, right. we're done. Right. And I remember Angela Davis saying at some point, every time we succeed in the social revolution, the entire landscape has to be cleared and we have to rethink every category right. because it transforms the very category by which we make sense. So we can't say, oh, no, now we have gay marriage. Fantastic, we can be married. She said that undoes everything what we knew about being LGBT community, about marriage, about the state, about privacy. We have to now rethink all this. And what oh, you're saying, going back to your own work, it's not that you now have all the answers and you yeah. can now say, oh, I made a mistake in the beginning. I didn't see enough. No, it's, it's that I can read differently. And my reading differently lets me see things that, you know, I was, yeah. I couldn't have seen before. It's I also it's fat. Yeah, I still have that paper. I'm one of these people who saves everything. Oh, and so I still have that paper from 1964. Yeah. <laughs> but I like this to go back also to something in the, this is around the 1800s to the 1830s or something like that. Uh, yeah, yeah. That you're calling it sexual revolution, that also there's so much in history that's yet unexamined or like Benjamin would say kind of unexploded. There's this mm -hmm. potential there that for us to read it in a new way not in a presentist way from your perspective today, but it contains so much that's unopened. Right, exactly, exactly. And that you can see, that depending on the lenses you put on, you right. can see things differently. Are there other things you think for young historians today that you found as fundamental, kind of important? Because I do actually think, my, my friend Shelley Rice, who I teach with at NYU, she's teaching a seminar on feminism mm -hmm. uh, in the spring. 2021 and it over inscribed in 10 minutes I imagine yeah because students actually want to need to understand the history of this movement and where we are today so what's your sense of some texts for historians especially that was were useful or still would be useful i don't know i always think simone de beauvoir is is, is one of the ones that yeah. you know, we we have to keep going back to um I do think the some of Judith Butler's work and and some of the there are, there are various in in article form. I think there's one in differences where there's an interview with Judith Butler and Gail Rubin. Gail Rubin is another of those people who yeah. whose earlier work was was really transformational. The the traffic in women article. Uh, so I think I would put together. In fact, I edited a book for Oxford University Press. I think it's out of print now, which was called something like feminism. Uh, and right. all of the great, the sort of big articles, Donna Haraway's Cyborg uh, right. Manifesto, Manifesto or, or actually not, her Feminism for a Marxist Dictionary is the thing oh, right. that we put in there. So I, you know, if, if that collection, I yep. think was, there, there's a lot of black feminism in it. I think that collection was meant to um, do what you're, what you're suggesting. It's out of print for reasons that, that but, know, but it was an Oxford University Press sort of, of readings in feminism. Wow. 
they should redo it. But uh, what we'll do for the scoreball series, we can put this in, we add a kind of reading list for people. Oh, that's great. And I'm sure the book is available probably, you know, in right. used bookstores or various right. places like that. Or online somehow, right? Or online, yeah, right. That's right. <laughs> I always forget online. <laughs> yeah, no, there's a lot of online that actually, this is actually the, one of the benefits of the pandemic, you can find a lot of things now. It's amazing, I know. It's kind really of great, yeah. But Joan, I really want to thank you. And I want to refer our listeners also to, so On the Judgment of History is a book that published by Columbia, I believe, right, yes, in yes. 2020. Um, the other books, Gender and the Politics of History, which really is, uh, as you said, and I wanted to emphasize, as you said this in our correspondence, you didn't invent gender as a useful <laughs> category. You actually gave shape to a discussion that was a lot of different people contributing. And the, the, the uh, gratifying thing to me is that it's a, it can still provoke those discussions. That's oh, yes. know, after 30 some, 30 some years, it's still there as something that people can turn to, to provoke a conversation. That's right. So, and then the other thing is um, Joan and I had a conversation about uh, free speech because you've been very active for the American Association of University Professors. You were on a task force, I think, on the Title IX discussions. Right, right. And you've, you've participated in these big debates on that. We had a, on the Think About It podcast, we have another episode on that. So, <laughs> so I, lo I love to have these conversations with you. Well, I love to have them with you. It's really, it really, you always ask really good questions, Uli. It's, it's well, good. but for me, it's really, um, the joy is to prepare and to, because I then I reread your essay, of course, which I teach many times, but then I read your, the unanswered questions in the American Historical Review. Right. If, uh, they, the forum. Did a, yeah. they did a forum and five people or several people responded, but it was great because you gave a little bit of the origin of this paper, what you wanted to do, how it's been misunderstood, what is correct and where to go now. Yeah. So for me, it's just really great. And um, I actually think, in teaching in 20, I don't know, I've been teaching for 25 or 26 years at NYU, the question of gender is the central question for all the students in a way. It's amazing. It really it's, was amazing. It's great that it is. And it was different 20 years ago, what former was to, it was today. And then we'll now see after the Trump presidency, I, <laughs> I, uh, there's a shift also, a cultural shift, but you know, obviously this, this other kind of pushback doesn't go away. No, that's 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 going to be interesting to see. Um, but you know, the proud boys are not so proud anymore. <laughs> that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, let's they lost their father figure. <laughs> that's, that's right. Let's hope they will be humble. But Joan, I, I want to thank you, so Joan Scott, um, so uh, professor emerita at the School for of Social Science at Institute for Advanced Study. Thank okay. you so much. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you. <laughs>